Hilchos Naziros Perek Shishi, The Laws of the Nazir Vow, Chapter 6. Yesterday we launched into the details of what's called Isure Nazir, the prohibitions that come along with the Naziros Vow. When a person takes a vow, I'm going to be a Nazir, what exactly does that entail? So the Ramam says it entails three things. Staying away from the vine, products of the vine, grapes, wine, vinegar, you name it. Not shaving your hair, and not becoming ritually impure from a corpse in any of the ways that it transmits impurity, by touching, by carrying, by being in the same room. Today, in this chapter, the Rambam discusses the consequences of violating those prohibitions. What happens if a Nazir does drink wine, or if a Nazir does shave his hair, or does become ritually impure from a corpse? And generally speaking, the way it's going to be outlined is that violating the prohibition against drinking wine comes with no consequences. Nothing gets disturbed. You continue keeping the Nazir term as you would. Violating the shaving prohibition it depends on how much you shaved. Less than the majority of your hair, then it's like the wine. Nothing happens. Once you shave the majority of your head, you got to pause for 30 days. Because after 30 days, you consider to have well-grown hair, and then you continue counting your Nazira's term. Violating the prohibition against becoming impure, that's the most extreme. In most cases, when a Nazir becomes impure, he actually has to shave his head, bring sacrifices, and completely begin his count anew. There are some cases where he doesn't have to shave. There are other cases where nothing actually happens, and we'll see those in detail today and tomorrow. However, that's the general idea. In other words, the three Isure Nazir, the three prohibitions of a Nazir, each carry a different level of consequence. Wine the lowest, shaving next, and impurity, the highest consequences. Now let's see it inside in the Rambam. Halacha Aleph, Nazir Shashasa Yayin, the Ochal Yetzim in Agefen. If a Nazir violates the first prohibition, he drinks wine or eats anything which comes from the vine, Afilu Yamim Rabim, even for many days in a row. He doesn't destroy not even one day from his count of the Nazir's term. And similarly, if a person were to shave a minority, which means less than a majority, less than 51% of his hair on his head, whether inadvertently or purposely, if he violates it in the way of only shaving a minority, nothing happens. But if most of the hair on his head was shaved, whether with a razor or with a tool like a razor, and the hairs are too short, they're not long enough that you're able to bend the top to the root, as we saw yesterday. Bein bezad and bein mishgaga. Then it doesn't matter how the shaving took place, whether you did it purposely, inadvertently. Afilu gilchu hulistim ba'inas. Even if robbers shaved you against your will, hariz asayser shleishim yoyim. The nazir destroys thirty days from his count. Ad sheyil leipera till he once again has uh, grown hair. Va'acharkach maschilim nes, and then he begins to count once again. In other words, resuming from wherever he left off. As the Raman illustrates, Kate says, what does this look like? Nadar Nazirus Meyayim. A person takes on a Nazirus term of 100 days. After 20 days, most of the hair on his head was shaven. He needs to wait 30 days for the hair on his head to begin growing back. After those 30 days pass, so he counts the remaining 80 days to complete his original 100 day Nazirus term. Those 30 days that you got to redo and wait for your hair to grow, that's not a light, a, a, like a free-for-all pause. You're still a Nazir fully. All the precise laws of Nazir apply to you then. But it doesn't accumulate towards the count of your term that you're trying to finish. They don't count to the number. But they certainly are days when you are a Nazir. That's all as far as the wine and the shaving. However, Nazir Shenitma, if a Nazir becomes impure from a dead body, again, whether purposely or inadvertently, even if Goyim, idol worshiping Gentiles, purposely against your will made you impure. Sasar Hakoil. First of all, the whole count is destroyed. You go back to square one or square zero, you gotta start counting the days again. Plus, there's a special mitzvah, you should shave your head in what's known as Tiglachas Tuma the shaving of impurity, umevi carbonized tuma, and you have to bring what's known as the sacrifices of impurity, and begin again to count the days of your nazirus. Shanamar, as it says, in the verse, which talks about a person who has to bring sacrifices for becoming impure, 
The first days fall away. And the verse ends off, Kitame Nizre, because his Nizira's term was um, impurified. And the point is that the days go away, you got to count again. The most frustrating thing. You had a term of Nizira's going for a year. You kept it perfectly. And on the last day, the day that you're meant to complete your term, the end of the day, just before sunset, the person becomes impure. Sasar HaKoyal, the entire count is obliterated and he's got to start again. But if he becomes impure after the final day of what should have been his Nazira's term, which had it not been a case of impurity, that would be the day to bring the sacrifices of purity. And we're going to go into this more in chapter 8. When a Nazir finishes his term properly, he does what's called a tiglachas tahara, a shaving of purity. There's a procedure where he has to shave his head and bring sacrifices of purity as a way to show the completion of his Nazir term. The way that would typically work would be that on the day that you complete the term of Nazirus, you shave your head, go to the mikveh. The next day, you bring sacrifices. So that day, which should have been the day that you brought sacrifices, had you stayed pure. And then, on that day, he became impure. He only destroys 30 days. The Kate said, Yasa, what do you do? May the carbonized tuma kishayitar. Since the bottom line is that you became impure, you have to first take care of that impurity. You got to bring sacrifices of impurity when you become pure from the, from the corpse tuma. Umegaleach tiglachas tuma, shave your head like one who would shave his head in impurity. Umaschilimnes nazir shleishimya, and then count another 30 days. That's the 30 which got destroyed and have to be recounted. Umegaleach tiglachas tara, umevi carbonized tara, and then. That will mark the conclusion of your full term. You'll shave your head in purity. You'll bring sacrifices in purity. But if the Nazir went so far, he completed his term, he went into the mikveh, he brought his sacrifices, and the blood of the sacrifices, as we're going to describe again in chapter 8 at length, part of the procedure was that the blood of the sacrifices should be sprinkled onto the Nazir. If even one of the bloods of the sacrifices was already sprinkled on the Nazir, and then he becomes impure, no destroying anything. You're impure, so you got to wait till you can become pure. Once you become pure again, you just continue bringing the sacrifices of purity and ignore the fact that you became impure. So in other words, what, what, what emerges over here is that we have three steps. Becoming impure during your term totally destroys it. Becoming impure the day after your term, when you should have brought sacrifices, destroys 30 days. Becoming impure after the sacrifices have been brought doesn't destroy anything. But now the Rambam adds one more scenario. The Nazir becomes impure on the day after the day that he should have brought sacrifices had he done everything properly. This guy was a little bit of a lazy Nazir, or he was delayed. He meant to get to the temple in time, came a little late. He should have shaved two days ago. He didn't. Should have brought his sacrifices yesterday. He didn't. Now he's like two days later. Most texts have the word oy, but we're going to read it as im. Im gilach achar malais. This would be a day where you should have been already growing a new set of hair had you shaved in the proper time after the term was concluded. In other words, this, this day is so far removed from the Nazir's term, that had you gone and operated according to the standard procedure, you would already be after your carbonus and already be growing your new set of hair. So here too, even though you didn't shave in this scenario, you don't destroy anything. Even though you haven't shaved yet, because the, conclu- the term has concluded, everything attached to it is concluded. You're, you're, you're way over. You're over time. Even if you didn't shave, but at this point, once you become impure, it doesn't make any influence. So we now have four scenarios. During the term, uh, the day after the term, before the sacrifices, and the day after the term, after the sacrifices, and the day after that. And there's going to be a fifth scenario where there is no consequence at all for becoming impure. If you became impure on the first or second day of your term, so you don't undo those days. Of course you're impure. Wait till you get pure. Uh, bring your sacrifices, but you don't have to destroy the count. The count resumes after that. Shanemar, because it says in the verse which describes 
this consequence, in the plural, the first days have to fall away, which means there has to be at least two full days have passed in order for those days to fall away. Therefore, of course, if you became impure on the third day and on, you destroy all the previous days. But on the first or second day, while you have to go through the procedure that happens to an who becomes impure, you don't suffer the consequence of destroying all the previous days. If a person takes a vow to become a Nazir while he is already impure from a corpse, so were he to be a Nazir first, now there's an Avera, there's a prohibition to become impure. Let's say he's already impure. He was at a funeral yesterday. He touched a corpse. He's involved in the Chavra Kadisha. And then, while in the state of being impure, he takes a vow to become a Nazir. So essentially he became a Nazir in a state of impurity. It says that I'm Amchala of Naziros, the Naziros vow takes effect. And the fact that he became impure yesterday is fine. But from now on, going forward, if he becomes impure again, if he drinks wine, if he shaves, like he is going to get lashes. If he stays in the state of impurity for multiple days, they don't begin the count of the Naziros until he gets the ashes of the Para Aduma sprinkled on the third and seventh day and goes to the Mikvah on the seventh day. I didn't explain this clearly before, but the way to become pure from corpse impurity is waiting a period of seven days, of which on the third and seventh day, a special sprinkling procedure from the waters of the para aduma mixed with the ashes of the red heifer is sprinkled on the person. That's how you become pure from being tmeimes, from being impure from a dead body. And again, by the way, I said yesterday, these are laws that are going to be explored at length in the 10th book of the Raman. There's a whole book on the ritual uh, purity and impurity. Here we're just mentioning them insofar as they're related to the laws of the Nazir. Point is, a person takes a vow to become a Nazir and he is in a state of corpse impurity, he can't begin his count until he becomes pure. This person who made the vow while he was impure, the seventh day on which he sprinkled for the second time with the ashes of the red heifer, and on which he goes to the mikvah, already begins to count as day one for his Nazir's term. Aval Nazir Taher Shanitma, but were it to be a case where a person takes a vow of a Nazir, he's pure. And later he becomes impure, he only begins to count or resume his count, count again on the eighth day. In other words, the day after the full purity procedure is, is uh, concluded. And the reason, of course, is because when you are a pure Nazir who becomes impure, besides for becoming pure again, you have to also bring a set of sacrifices, which happens the next day. And therefore, the count can only begin after the sacrifices are brought. Versus a case of a person who becomes a Nazir while he's impure, while he has to get rid of that impurity, there's no sacrifices that have to be brought for that. And therefore, on the seventh day, when you're basically pure, you, you got to the mikvah, you're done. And so, begin your count right then. Halacha ches misha nadar v'hu sakfaris. A person takes a vow to become a Nazir while in the cemetery. So here he is, in the cemetery, he takes a vow to become a Nazir. Naziros chalalav, even though he's in a state of impurity, the Naziros takes effect. And again, if he waits there a number of days, they don't count. The, in other words, the Naziros is upon him in which he, he cannot uh, violate the prohibitions of a Nazir. But the count doesn't begin while he's there. The next line in the Rambam has uh, a lot of comments on it. Different commentaries believe that it should be emended. Um, but we're going to read it first straight, and then I'll give you what the commentaries say. The Ramam says, For the fact that he's waiting there in the cemetery, he can get lashes for that. If he's warned against staying there, he can get lashes. If somebody gave him a warning not even to take the vow of Naziros to begin with, He doesn't need to shave his hair when he leaves. This is the perplexing line, because this implies that had he been warned against taking a vow of Naziros, and he still took the vow of Naziros, he becomes impure to the level that when he leaves the cemetery, he has to shave his hair, which is untrue. Because whenever you take a vow of Naziros, already in a state of impurity, once that impurity goes away, there's no requirement to shave or to bring sacrifices for that impurity. Therefore, the commentaries want to amend in one of two ways. The Radvaz says that you have to add in a, little, a couple of words. The imhisru bay shalayazir sham loike. If they warned him not to take the vow of Naziris, he also gets lashes for that. 
In other words, in addition to getting lashes for staying in the, t- in the cemetery afterwards, the previous line of the Rambam, the Lake Al Sham, you also get lashes additionally had you been warned for taking the vow of Naziris there to begin with. And then a new law, that in general, when you take a vow of Naziris in a cemetery, the impurity that comes upon you is not so extreme. You don't have to shave your hair when you, when you come out and when you get rid of that impurity. Kesef Mishnah, similar idea, different emendation. He says that the, the vav in the beginning of the word vi'im hisrubai needs to be deleted and moved to the next sentence. And hence the Rambam reads as follows. Vileika al shihiyasai sham im hisrubai shalayazir sham. You get lashes for staying in the cemetery if you were warned against making the vow of Nazirus there. And then, a new law, the same thing as the Radvaz, you don't have to shave your head when you come out having gotten rid of the impurity of the cemetery. The difference in the Radvaz and the Kesef Mishnah is whether there's two sets of lashes here or one. According to the Kesef Mishnah, you only get a set of lashes for staying in the cemetery if you were warned to begin with not to make the vow of Naziris in the cemetery. According to the Radvaz, they're two separate things. First of all, you get lashes for staying in the cemetery. Plus, additionally, if they were warned against making the vow of Naziris to begin with, you get lashes for that as well. At any rate, the point is that when you take a vow of Naziris in a cemetery, the Naziris falls upon you, takes effect, the count doesn't begin till you leave, and also when you leave, you don't have to shave your head. But if, after taking the vow of Naziris, you become impure with an additional level of impurity, such an impurity which would require the Nazir to shave, we'll see tomorrow at length that there are different types of impurity from a corpse. While it's forbidden for a Nazir to come into contact with a corpse in any way, some ways require the Nazir to go through the Tiglachas Tumah and the Karbanas Tumah, which we talked about, the shaving of impurity, the sacrifices of impurity. Others, while you become impure, you don't have to shave and bring those sacrifices of impurity. So the Ramam says, if a person becomes impure with such a level of impurity, which would require him to shave, still, since over here, he took the vow of Naziris while in the cemetery. So he was never pure to begin with. This type of impurity will not cause him in this scenario to have to shave and to bring sacrifices. A person comes into a cemetery in a protected way, in a box, in a chest, in a cabinet, or as my comic imagination would put it in a plane, say the plane was covered. And as the commentaries insert here, while in the cemetery, in a protected state, he made a vow to become a Nazir. So in a certain way, while he's in the space of a cemetery, halachically, he's not in the cemetery. This is like a regular person, pure, taking a vow to become a Nazir. Then, comes the friend, uncovers the cabinet, the chest. You pick up the, uh, the cover of the cockpit over there. Someone comes and opens up the plane thereby making this person impure. So one would think that this should be a, just like a pure Nazir who becomes impure. He says, the Amam, nevertheless, even though he, he stays there for a while, you don't get biblical lashes. The rabbis will give you their rabbinic lashes, but this is not a case of biblical lashes. What's indeed the difference between this case and a regular pure Nazir? So the commentaries explain that when you're a pure Nazir, or you've taken the vow already, then initially, when you come into the cemetery, you put your Naziris at risk. In other words, your entry into the cemetery was made in a ne- negative, possibly destructive way. Here, the entry to the cemetery was done in a completely permitted way. He hadn't even made the vow to become a Nazir. He made the vow while in the protected space in the cemetery. So now when he's uncovered, it's a little bit more lenient and he doesn't get biblical lashes. Halacha yut. We continue the same scenario. A person came into the cemetery in a permitted way, in a protected space, takes the vow in the cemetery, thereby bringing a Naziris onto himself while he's technically impure. And now what happens is, says the Rambam, Yatsam mi besakvaris. This guy leaves the cemetery. He doesn't take care of his impurity. He simply leaves the impure space. Veshoha yamim v'chazar v'nichnas, waits a couple of days, and goes back in. During those couple of days, he never introduced any new level of impurity, but he never took care of the old level of impurity. 
says the Rambam, Ein Eden loy. Those days that you spent in the interim outside of the cemetery do not count towards your Nazir's tomb, because of course you're still impure from the original being in the cemetery. Yotza, the Hiza Vitar, if you went out of the cemetery and you also took care of your original impurity, he sprinkled upon himself the ashes of the Parah Duma. He went to the mikvah, became pure. Umana yamim nazirus, and then began to actually count proper days of his nazirus term. The chazer lebe sakvaris, and then went back into the cemetery. Oisam yamim shemana oilin lai. Those days which he counted do count for him. In other words, the days that he spent before re-entering the cemetery, because he was actually pure, um, he can count those days. Now, by the way, this is only referring to the, the specific case at the end of halachates, where it was a type of impurity which wouldn't hold him liable by biblical law. Even if he came back into the cemetery on the eighth day, after becoming impure, the seventh day when he had the ashes of the paraduma sprinkled upon him, counts for his naziris. But if he became impure in the cemetery, with a high-level type of impurity, one that would require him to shave, maybe carbon tuma, then of course he's a regular Nazir who became impure. Got to bring sacrifices of impurity, the seisariyamimakaidmim, destroy the previous days, umengaliyatiglachas tuma, and shave the shaving of impurity. Halacha Yid we're talking so much about shaving of impurity, what does it look like? What, what are the steps when a Nazir becomes impure and goes through this shaving sacrifice process? Says the Rambam, tiglachas tuma ketzadhi. What does it look like to go through the shaving of impurity? First of all, When a Nazir becomes impure from a corpse, when one of the types of impurities, which will require him to shave, we'll get the full list tomorrow. Step one, he's got to get sprinkled with the ashes of the paraduma, as you can see here, number one, on the third day and the seventh day after becoming impure. Then number two, He's got to shave the hair on his head on the seventh day of the count since becoming impure. And then he needs to go to the mikvah on the seventh day after the sprinkling, like anybody who would be impure from a dead body. Now, while on the board I put here number three, and it sounds like the mikvah comes after, specifically the shaving, notice that Ambam says, after the sprinkling, which implies that the mikvah doesn't have to be after the shaving, it could be any time after the sprinkling. And the Rebbe notes how this a little bit contrasts to um, the Tiglachas Tara, a regular pure shaving, where that definitely has to be. Um, the shaving has to be after the mikvah. Here, it implies that the shaving could be before the mikvah. Just that's a, a note that, 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 the, that the Rebbe makes based on this Ramam over here. Then, anyway... He's done all three. He's got sprinkled, he's got haircutted, and he's got then immersed in the mikvah. Umariv Shimshai. He needs to wait till the sun sets. Umevi Karbanaisa Bashmini and step four, bring his sacrifices on the next day, the eighth day. The keves ben The sacrifices of impurity for a nazir are two birds, two pigeons, two turtle doves. One is an oila, a burnt offering, one is a chatas, a sin offering and a keves, a sheep, in its first year for a guilt offering. The seyser kalayam makaidmim, you destroy all the previous days, umaschil limnes nezirusa, and you begin to count your nezirus term anew. Vim gilach bashmini, if he shaved on the eighth day, he waited an extra day, maybe karbanaisa baybalyam, you can bring your sacrifices on the same day. The point is not that the shaving and sacrifices be on different days, it's that the sacrifices be brought only on the eighth day. So if you waited to shave to the eighth day, you can still bring sacrifices on the eighth day. When do you begin to count your Nazirus anew? Once you bring the sin offering. In other words, even though there are three animals involved in the offerings, the truth is all we really care about for the count to restart is the bird who is a sin offering. But the burnt offering and the guilt offering don't stop you from recounting. In other words, if they were brought later, the count can already begin once the bird of the chatas was brought. Let's say he did the sprinkling of the paraduma, third day, seventh day, but he didn't go to the mikvah. And then he waited a couple of days. So you got to wait till the mikvah. Once you go to the mikvah, you wait till the sun goes down, bring your sacrifices the next day, and then the count begins. 
Taval v'heret of Shimshai v'eichar karban yisav. If you went to the mikvah in the original time, you waited until sun went down, but you delayed bringing your sacrifices. What we said before, the burnt off, the, the sin offering is the operative key offering. You can't begin to count your term again until you bring that sin offering. But again, as we explained, the burnt offering and the guilt offering don't stop you from counting anew. When the Nazir shaves for impurity, None of the special laws that are, that are done for a Nazir who shaves in purity apply here. For example, you don't have to shave at the entrance to, to the Holy Temple. You don't have to throw the hair under the fire. I've shown this picture a number of times, but for a pure Nazir, what would happen is they would shave him in the special room, special chamber, and he would throw his hair in the fire under the pot where it was, it was cooking his offering. But when you're doing it in impurity, these two steps aren't required. However, wherever this Nazir, impure Nazir, chooses to shave, whether in the rest of Israel or in the Holy Temple, his hair is forbidden to have any benefit from it. The tone kvura has to be buried. Or if you burn it, the ash is also forbidden, like the ash of anything which should be buried. But when it's Nazir shaves in the temple, once you throw it under the pot cooking the ash on the guilt offering, you're already fulfill your obligation, you don't have to go bury that ash. Halacha tezvav, nazir shenit matum eis harbe. A nazir becomes impure multiple times. Ben she yisro bel kalachas v'achas, ben she le yisro bel kalachas v'achas, whether or not he was warned individually for each one. Ein ne mevi al tum eis avala karban echot. For the sum total of the impurities, you only bring one set of sacrifices. Ba medvar mamurim, when do we say that? Shenit mapam shniya, kaidim she yavi karban eis tumari shayna. If you became impure multiple times before bringing the original initial set of sacrifices. Even if you delay the sacrifices a couple of days, after becoming pure, before bringing your sin offering, and you became impure during those days of waiting. Bottom line, you became impure a second time before bringing your initial set of sacrifices for the first time. It goes under the same rubric, and the sacrifices takes care of both impurities. But would you have become impure? Then became pure. Brought the sin offering which basically resets the clock, and then became impure a second time after bringing the sin offering, even though he didn't bring two out of three. He didn't bring the guilt offering, he didn't bring the burnt offering for the first round of impurity, but he already brought the sin offering, that cuts it off, and now if he becomes impure again, he's liable to bring another set of sacrifices. Halacha tezayin. Nazir shegilach tiglachas tara. A nazir was a good guy. He kept his entire term properly. He shaved the shaving of purity. And then, after he shaves, it turns out he's notified that he was actually impure during his Nazira's term. He was at a party, there was a coffin under the building, or he took a walk in the park, there was a skeleton that he walked over. So then it depends what kind of impurity this was. If he became impure with a source of impurity which was known to people at the time, he just didn't know about it. Sasar HaKol. He destroys the entire Nazirus. Or maybe Karben Eish Tumah. Megalech Teglachas Tumah. You got to bring sacrifices of impurity. You got to shave a shaving of impurity. Or Meina Nazirus Acheres. And you count, recount of the Nazirus term. Or maybe Karben Eish Taran. At the end, you bring sacrifices of purity. However, Ve'imetumas HaTohayim Nitma. If the impurity which he's now retroactively notified about was an impurity that was what's called the impurity of the deaths. Nobody knew about it. A guy had died in the park and a skeleton went underground, nobody in the world knew about the skeleton. Later on, it was discovered. But at the time that he became impure, nobody was aware of it. Then, it doesn't disrupt the count. This is a halacha from oral tradition, straight from Moshe Rabbein on Mount Sinai, and there's a difference between tumma of the depths and tumma that everybody was aware of. Now, this halacha is stated where a Nazir already shaved the shaving of purity. What if he hadn't yet shaved? but he was already in the process of bringing the sacrifices. Apparently, even though usually you, sh- you shave before the sacrifices, but here, he brought the sacrifices before he shaved. It says, If he finds out that he was impure before any of the bloods of the sacrifices was sprinkled on him, whether or not it was a tumah of the depths or not, if he hadn't shaved, and the sacrifices, blood hadn't been sprinkled on him, so in a way his vow still wasn't complete, his term wasn't complete, 
he's got to go back and destroy the entire count. But if he finds out after even one of the bloods of the sacrifices was sprinkled on him, even though he hasn't shaved yet, if it's an unknown source of Tuma, Tuma Satahayim doesn't disrupt the count. What qualifies as Tuma of the depths? A source of impurity which nobody is aware of even at the end of the world. In other words, if a guy killed somebody privately, and at least the murderer knows about where the guy is, someone knows about it here, nobody can know about it. The law of Tuma Satahayim was only said for a person who dies on his own accord. Aval Harugloi, but not a murdered corpse. Shari Yedea by Zasharag, because the murderer knows, knows where he is. Nimtsa Hameis Galoi, Ein Zu Tumas Atahim. If the dead body was discovered open, revealed, that's not Tum of the Depths, even if no one knew about it, but it's open on earth. In other words, earth knew about it, so to speak. Nimtsa Mushkag Bakakai Sat. Halacha Yutes, Nimtsa Hameis Galoi. If the dead body was discovered to be out in the open, that's not called Tumor of the Depths, because it wasn't in the Depths, even if no one knew about it. Nimtza Mushka Bekarkes Ma'ara the Hamaim Al-Gabav. If the dead body was discovered to be sunken in the bottom of a cave with water on top of it, Harezu Tumor Satahayim She'ena Yedua, that's Tumor of the Depths, not known. Haya Tamun Betevin Ebitzreiris, if it was buried in a pile of straw or pebbles, Harezu Tumor Satahayim, that's called Tumor of the Depths. Bemayim, Ba'afela, or Benekiki Aslayim, if it was simply covered, submerged in water, or in darkness, or in the clefts of a rock, that's not called impurity of the depths. Another became impure from a dead body, and he went to go dip in a cave, presumably for a mikvah. He wanted to become pure. With that purity, he now goes and brings the sacrifices of impurity for becoming impure. Umana Naziros and I begins his count anew, Vigilach Tiglachastara, and shaves properly a shaving of purity. Then it turns out that when he originally went to the mikvah to go get rid of his impurity, there was actually a dead body stuck at the bottom of that cave. Even though we just said in the last halacha that would qualify as in this case, he destroys the whole count. Because we have what's called the chazaka. Our last presumption. What was our last known status about this nazir? He was impure. So when he went into the, uh, the, the cave to go to the mikvah, so long as we cannot ascertain with 100% certainty that he was pure, he's not pure. He reverts back to his last known status of impurity. It's the presumption of a person who's ritually impure to stay ritually impure till he becomes certainly pure. But if he had gone into that cave, not for the mikvah, just to cool off, he's actually innocent until proven guilty. He's considered pure unless he knows that he touched the, touched the dead body. If the dead body was discovered floating on the water, he can be assumed to be impure. Because the person, when it's a floating corpse, there's a presumption that he may have touched the corpse.